I need to be done in about an hour. <laughs> and that's how we start it. <laughs> the guy who shows up 40 minutes late every week just gets on here and goes, we need to be done in an hour. Of course. <laughs> Welcome to the Money Lap. I'm Parker Klegman, joined as always by my good friend Landon Castle. We talk about all motorsports on here, and Landon, uh, we are on a Thursday once again because we've had some crazy schedules the last couple of weeks. So th- for, the, for those of you, easy for me to say, that have expected us to have this out Wednesday afternoons, evenings, we apologize. Um, but we are here, and we have motorsports. That We do. We have both those things. So that is, that is the upside of waiting is that you still get it. And great things come to those who wait, and I hope this show – is great for you hold on hold on what i'm gonna hijack your pr lap for just a second and tell you that i'm i'm reading the show notes and today is the day that i learned that the money lap has a fantasy league (laughs) (laughs) oh god this is this is just hey hey next year can you please invite me into this fantasy league (laughs) i i'm pretty sure i texted you like four times but it's okay (laughs) <laughs> this is just I'm obvious. I'm not joking. I'm reading this like, dang, thanks to all 200 of you. Go ahead. You know what, Parker? Take it away. Hey, you're valued people of the Money Lap community as Landon, a 50% of it is obviously so involved. He knows you're all here and has just found out after two years of this league. Uh, we appreciate three, you playing. actually. Three years. Three years of you playing. So it's flown by. I'm terrible at fantasy because I can never keep up with it, but... Um, hey, on today's show, we are going to start with some heavy F1 stuff because uh, we have a cool announcement after the PR lap as to what we will be doing for the Las Vegas GP. Stay tuned We for will that. not be driving F1 cars next year. It's a different announcement. Good. I'm glad you got that out of the way. I, was, I bet most were thinking and anticipating such a thing, and it, it's not happening. We will talk NASCAR. There's been a ton of NASCAR news uh, this week as everyone's dropping news to get ahead of the Thanksgiving off week, essentially. Um, and some other IndyCar and sports car and that sort of thing out there that we'll be discussing. Uh, before we get into the uh, Money Lap Fantasy results, just quickly, if I sound a little tired, a little wore out, I just filmed for two days up at Lime Rock for my YouTube channel in something I've wanted to do for like, I don't know. I've had this idea for a long time, never knew how to really do it. Uh, we finally did it, and it was insane. Um, I can't say too much other than... If you've ever, oh hey, is that Sinatra? Dogs. Uh, no, I got bumper and cricket with me. I got bumper oh. and cricket with me today. Love that dogs. Nonetheless, long story short, um, if you've ever thought you could be fast as a race car driver, you might have the chance with what I've just done. So stay tuned. That's gonna be fun. I'm pretty wore out. Had the lucid air for this week, by the way. My friends at the Autopian. Really? Yeah. Grand Touring Edition, 819 horsepower, 885 pound-feet of torque. Longest electric range of any electric vehicle on the market right now at 512 miles uh, by the EPA. And it, the battery never goes down. I mean, I've driven it all over the place. It's unbelievable. The range anxiety does not exist because I'm not sure you ever actually have to charge it. And if you do, it charges in about five seconds. Unbelievable car. Um, do you want me to see if there's any on the wholesale market while we're while we're no, talking? No, I don't. Here? Really, I don't want one this moment. I don't have a need. I think electric cars are the best if you are someone who commutes the same place every day. Mm-hmm. And I don't have that. I don't really need a car uh, most days. So, but mm-hmm. if I did have to be in a car every day and commute an hour, two hours, whatever it is, I think an electric car would be the move, especially Was one it- like this where this car, unlike Teslas, what really sticks out to me, and I'll do a whole review for the Autopian. Uh, at theautopian.com, is that what's evident about Lucid is that they, for now, at least, think of the driver as being an integral part of the equation. Whereas Tesla, mm-hmm. you know, is hell-bent on removing the driver. They want to get you out of it. They want to get to full self-driving. They, won't, they don't want you to think about driving. Hell, they've removed half the steering wheel and some, that weird yoke thing they had in, at one point. So this, on the other hand, is all about driving. And it feels mm-hmm. a lot more like a performance sedan from... What was 10 it years ago. Model? Grand Touring. The Grand Touring. Yeah, was the it, second highest. Was it comfortable? I, like, what was the... Incredibly. 
the 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 smell is the best it smells like a bmw in the inside which i always think is one of the best smelling cars in terms of the leather they use and that sort of stuff it has these massage seats that have like 10 options unbelievable massage seats um the only the some of the the issues though one of the fails is there's like a parking assist in terms of you know the beeps and the the 3d look down deal and all that but every time you, when you're parallel parking, when you get within 10 inches of a car behind you, it immediately stops and hits the brake. And so you, it freaks out and it makes it really hard to parallel park with all the aids on. You almost want to turn them off and just do it yourself. Hmm. So that's a little frustrating. But there's a, there's a lot of pluses with that car. It's, I think it might be the best electric car in the world. Really? But possibly, you know, a little too expensive at, what, 120000 bucks. And Oh, is it 100? A little I late. It was more. Yeah, that one's 120. I believe. There's okay. a there's a 2023 with 15,000 miles going through Mannheim, PA tomorrow. Mm. Hey, oh. how is the so that's my update. How is the car biz? What do we need to car, know? Car biz is good. Car is biz it is booming. Good. It, <laughs> uh, Castle Motors has been good. Yeah, we've, let's go. Uh, October was a record month, and November is on its way to top that. So we'll see how the We'll see how the holiday week goes, but um, it's been good. I, it's about like anywhere uh, you've probably heard if you read about car business news, the hardest part is buying the cars, not selling them. That's if wild. They're, if they're priced right and you know marketed well, they, they tend to sell. Our cars don't stick around very long. It's, it's just g- buying them. You know, but when you got them, record sales numbers. Love that. That's right. It's good times in the, the Castle Motors time period. Big dealership guy, big selling guy, <laughs> big sales. Always be selling, you know. All that. What other <laughs> inspirational things can I send your way about selling? <laughs> I whenever leave I find the car an sales up to the actual salesman. Yeah, well, whenever I find an inspirational selling any like meme or anything, I always send it to you, and I'm like, hey, keep on going, bud. <laughs> um, but yeah, we're kind of both in the car world in that sense now, so. I had it on the race track and the autocross track and that thing we pounded around and it's forever and it just barely ever lost performance lost didn't lose performance barely used the battery and what gets me about electric cars is because of the insane torque and power they are mm-hmm. like they actually in a weird way are some of the most fun cars for like tight smaller race tracks and the weight because they're so stupidly like crazy heavy, you they almost in like in smaller condensed corners and such mimic driving a stock car in some respects. Overpowered, really? super heavy. Yeah, like you can quit in a forty five mile an hour corner, you can feel what it's almost like to be in a stock car at a hundred and twenty mile an hour corner just because of these insane weight. So I, I find them to be a lot of fun in that sense. Um I w I've been wanting to drive the Hyundai Ionic five and because that's supposed to be a lot of fun. It has that ability to just turn all the power to the rear sort of thing. And I just think a rear wheel drive, crazy high horsepower electric car is got to be one of the more fun things you could bring onto like a smaller track or an autocross track, that sort of thing. The uh, yeah. Ionic 5N has a cool fake transmission system too, well, where you can I told you about it. the F-150 Lightning, right? What about it? Well, my dad has a Lightning. Mm. And that thing, I don't know what the different modes are for it, but I, I'm pretty sure that it's faster than an ARCA car. Oh, definitely. <laughs> it, is, <laughs> it is insanely fast. They're, so, they're nuts. They make me – like when you do the hard launches in them – I've told you my story about the Porsche Taycan where like after doing, I don't know, 15 or so of the hard launches in a row, I got physically sick. Like I wanted to throw up so, because it's just – Yeah, they just pull so hard. It's, and you can you just never prepared for it. No matter how many times you do it, whatever you're sitting in a road car and it just knocks you back in the seat so intensely, it's insane. So, all right, we promised motorsports chat. We mentioned the money lap fantasy um, league, so we got the results. We want to announce the top three here and let you know that we will be getting in touch with you to send you a prize. So if you are one of these top three and you're a listener and you played, Josh is working to get you a prize and it's special yes. trust me it is amazing you'll never forget it you're gonna probably put it on display for the rest of your life and your grandkids will ask about it and you're gonna say 
that is the time that I competed in Landon Castle's Fantasy League, in which he never even knew existed, <laughs> against Parker Kligerman as well. I love it. So let's announce the winners. Uh, in third place was The Showman. In second place, C. Jennings. And in first, Hendrix, 5'9", 24, 48, with slashes in between all the numbers. Congratulations to you three. You are the top three. You will be getting a prize. Uh, you also beat Josh, who finished fourth, and his mom, who finished fifth. So you've knocked the Mendozas out of the top three in their prizes, meaning that we don't have to send any prizes internally, which is great. <laughs> I'm going to make um, a fourth place prize for myself. How dare you? How dare you? for my mom. And then you mentioned it, over 200 people, 204 people participated this season. So we hope to make that higher next year. Speaking of being higher, we had no new Apple reviews landed. We hit 200 and stopped. That's it. We hit the maximum number of reviews. It's but it's the ceiling. You can't break through, <laughs> apparently. If you would like to leave a review, we could get to 201. We now want to get to 300. Let us know in the comments on YouTube or send us an email or whatever what we should do when we hit 300. That's our next benchmark. It's been a harder grind to 200 than it was 100. We need to get to 300. Let us know what we should do. We had no new Spotify reviews, but we did have some comments on YouTube that were fun. One here, Mark Winterbottom fan, uh, V8 Supercar fan. The money lap is awesome. That's great. Thank you. Um, and we have from CKY Moto. I missed my local collectible store. I was so young when it closed. I don't even remember what it was called, but I remember Big Daddy's Racing on the Berlin Turnpike where we raced what was basically RC cars from a desk with pedals and a steering wheel on a banked oval track like Bristol. It was so much fun. Now they no longer have a storefront and just have a trailer and you can book them for parties and events. Just like you, Landon. He's always looking for the nostalgia of what we had at the old collectible store in the mall. Miss it. I, you know, I um, as long as people are going to comment on me talking about the nostalgia, I am going to continue talking about it on this pod because mm. that that makes me feel so great that there are people that remember the old school basement diecast collectible stores, sports memorabilia stores in their local mall, especially going into the holiday season. Which is why we do have to grow up and move on from this from the old days into the modern world and go to spoilerdiecast.com, one of the fastest growing companies in the diecast industry. What sets them apart, Parker? Well, they pride themselves on exceptional service. They have incredible ship times. Their sh- their orders ship either same or next day. You get your hands on your favorite products in no time, reliably. Coming into the holiday season here, you get free shipping on orders over twenty dollars. Do we have any specials with them? We need to figure out if we need to we need to get with them. And We're going to get what their them. specials are for yeah. Black Friday because they have over eleven hundred unique products currently in stock, mostly NASCAR focused, uh, but they've got a little bit of everything. Dirt, sprint cars, IndyCar, F1. They are passionate race fans like us. They grew up in the basement of a shopping mall, just like we did. Just begging our parents to let us buy the cool collectibles. But SpoilerDieCast.com is the place to get your diecast apparel, motorsports, collectibles. Let's go. Let's go. Love them. Go to SpoilerDieCast.com as we head into holiday season. It's the place to be. It's an excellent website. Top website, top shopping experience, top shipping experience, top customer service. They just went across all categories. It's pretty evident. And that's not just because they are our sponsor on this podcast. Show, show. Oh, my goodness. I I have to put a dollar in the jar. (laughs) But, Landon, I have a question. We met – well, we did say we were going to talk about F1. And we did Mm -hmm. say we have something exciting that we're doing. Mm -hmm. So, hey, Landon, have you ever been to a Formula One race? I haven't. Never been. I've been to a Formula One factory, hmm. but never been to a race. Well, now might be your chance because we are oh. hosting Friday and Saturday of this weekend for the F1 Las Vegas Grand Prix, a live watch-along experience with our friends at motorsport.com. That's motorsport.com where you can go there, see the stream. We'll have stats up on the stream. You also will be able to interact with us through their Discord chat, which is Motorsports Discord. Um, and most of all, the reason it might be your chance to go to an F1 race, 
we are going to be giving away a trip to F1 Miami 2025. Race tickets, flights, hotels, all you need for an amazing F1 weekend. All you have to do, if you want to get there, Landon, but you'll already be a part of this, is watch the Las Vegas GP with you and I. We'll play trivia. We'll show off our F1 knowledge. And someone out there watching along with us will win the trip of a lifetime. We've also, we also also going to be giving away a ton of amazing merch. Um, and most of all, you get us for hours on end, late at night. Who knows in what will happen? Night. Yeah, in the middle of the night, into the morning on Sunday. Uh, it's, I don't know how either of us are going to stay awake, but thankfully Red Bull's pretty involved with F1, and I will be utilizing, utilizing that product uh, <laughs> throughout this adventure. So join us there. It's at motorsport.com starting Friday night for FP3. Uh, so I think that's around 10 to be side, 1030 at night, mm-hmm. nine, nine, nine o'clock. That's at nine on Friday. And then we'll be a part of qualifying as well. And then of course the race on Saturday into Sunday morning. So and I will be broadcasting live from Miami. That's so right. this is, this is all leading into this big giveaway. So you can win your tickets and meet me there. I was trying to, you know, negotiate into this deal instead of just streaming for this, live on site from Miami um, to just stay there until the Miami GP next year. Uh, but we couldn't get that approved in the budget. But that's okay. It really made sense, though, to have you there for at least, what, six months, mm-hmm. scouting, getting yep. the feel on the ground, yep. seeing yep. how yep. early Still people might do start it. to get might ready for it. Might just do it on it. my own dime. Yeah, that makes sense. Might just do it. I like it. Yep. I like the quick move to Miami just for this sole reason. No other reason whatsoever. Got to run it by the wife first, but yeah. that should be no big deal. They'll be, she'll be cool with it. The kids, yep. I mean, they can come visit. There's flights. Mm-hmm. There's ways. Mm-hmm. So I think it's, uh, this makes total sense. And it's really just the economical thing to do. Why well, get like, flying back and forth? You get there early. You'll meet our winners from this event. Yep. Um, it makes great sense. I like it. Yeah, this, this is going to be fun, though. I am, I am looking forward to this. I am also nervous about staying awake because <laughs> I don't know if I've been awake past 10 o'clock let alone started something after 10 o'clock in a long time um but this is this is gonna be a cool stream for us to just you know really focus on f1 focus on on the las vegas gp this weekend um a lot of cool storylines going into the weekend uh being there the this the second event what, what would you call this i don't know the second event of the las vegas gp um it's gonna be a really really interesting weekend I, I would just call it the second time, the second running. Second event. Las Vegas should yeah, be. I don't know what that yeah, is. I don't. I mean, this the staying up part is tough. I don't think I've been up past 12 to 1 a.m. sober in probably three or four years. So that will be tough. I mean, I don't know if I have to be sober for this. We are streaming live from our homes in Miami, so maybe I don't have to be. But <laughs> we'll <laughs> – well, I'll, I'll, I'll ask the powers that be there to make it happen if, uh, if that's a requirement or not, but I assume so. Let's talk about the Las Vegas GP. Um, last year was a pretty interesting weekend. We had the manhole cover controversy to start the weekend, and then they had to mm-hmm. delay practice, and then they kicked everyone out. And it wasn't the best start for such a huge event that had garnered a lot of attention. But it redeemed itself in the race with cold temperatures. It was obvious the cars are sort of slipping around trying to get the tires up to temp. You have the super low downforce setups that a lot of the teams bring because they did an excellent job of making long straightaways uh, mm-hmm. on this street course, which means they want to get rid of the downforce and the drag, um, which is almost like a spa to Monza downforce Baku. level apparently. And, of course, Ferrari had a lot of speed. Max Verstappen won it in the end, but it was a great battle there towards the end. I mean, will we see something – like that again? Does this play in Ferrari's hands, being that it's a Monza-esque style place? I don't know. I mean, I, are you asking for my prediction, or are you yeah, just I was asking, asking prediction. an open-ended question? No, um, I, don't, I definitely don't want an open-ended side. Well, I was looking my for, heart, like, the internet I, my, hot take. My, my, heart, my heart is with, um, with a Ferrari performance, and, and yeah, I think on paper, the straightaways they are expecting – a similar advantage. They've done really well at those tracks this year. Um, I do think that there is, and maybe this is Ferrari downplaying their own, you know, where they're at, but uh, I don't know if they feel as confident going into the weekend on cold weather, cold tires as they mm. had been um, last year. So I, 
we'll that that was I think that was a big topic going into last year's race that is very was very typical of racing for me where it's like 30 degree weather something that they had never seen in a long time so the teams were all like are we even going to have cars on the track they might have to cancel they might have to you know and then but they put cars on the track the cars didn't fly off the track because of the weather <laughs> they did because of the manhole covers which F1 <laughs> supposedly fixed that but the cars didn't fly off the track everything was okay and we had a race right yep. and it's like so um i think that that drama is maybe past us the teams will will you just knowing how motorsports operates now they have a body of work to look at you know the track is not changed um we have another year on the pavement so there maybe could be some age in the pavement but i don't think that'll be a huge difference for for them i think the teams will will come a little bit more prepared um they'll know more about the cars and they'll be ready for the cooler weather so um, mm. I, just, I think it's a question for me on Ferrari, and if that's who I'm rooting for, I don't know if that's who I'm rooting for this weekend or not. Um, but they, you know, I think their ability to fire off on cold tires will be the determining factor for them because I think they've obviously run well this year on tracks with low drag. Yeah, they seem to have the low drag situation figured out. Their power plant obviously does a great job. And they're able to do a great job of getting the drag out of the race cars to be fast in those places. So I think that will be one. I could see Ferrari surprising people and winning because I think it's a little higher temps than last year. So it's not as bad. I was reading a lot of things about the teams and, as you put it, have learned and what to expect. And Pirelli brings their softest compounds, but they understand how they interact with the track, that sort of thing. But what I do love about this design of street course, and we've talked about it a lot on this podcast show. God, I am. I'm obviously mm. tired. I can't mm. believe I'm saying such a thing. Who am I? Jeez. Um, is that when they do these long straightaways, it creates the best scenario of low grip because it's a street course, low, low downforce, which means the cars wiggle around. You can see it under braking at the end of the back straightaway, which is awesome. Um, and I just love that. I think it's F1 at its best when they allow, when they force like them in this position. The the I think the track has like one point two miles worth of straightaways. Yeah, it's something like that. Um so what my last little note on this that I thought of while you were talking there that is maybe a notch in Ferrari's favor was last year Ferrari you know, Ferrari was fastest, were they not? Last year? They You're were kinda me. they kinda had the race to lose last year. And well they got ran down by Verstappen. And Verstappen won but that was, you know, Verstappen kind of had to steal the win last year, is what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. And if you disagree, or if the listeners disagree, then then let me know. But it, it, last year, I think Verstappen sort of had to steal the win, and this was a Verstappen that was dominant, right? Yeah. This year, we do not have the same Verstappen. Yeah. Right. So does that? What does that mean for his ability to steal this win? Where are their cars at? Maybe, you know, even though we're talking about Ferrari sort of being unsure about cold weather, tire, cold, you know, tires on cold weather and whatnot, firing off in cold weather, maybe, maybe they are in more of an advantage than they were last year. Hmm. It's an interesting point. Uh, will we see a safety car is a question. I think so. I just think this Hopefully. track, yeah, I think this track, just the way, all the factors I talked about, cold temperatures, low downforce, the design of the track, it not having a ton of stuff that's going to run on it once again. I think mm -hmm. all those factors add up to potential safety cars in terms of people making a mistake. I so, can tell you that this NASCAR guy is not going to stay up till 3 in the morning and watch a wire-to-wire -wire green flag race. <laughs> <laughs> I want to see caution come out and these boys come down and come down their road for four tires and fuel. I feel. Well, they don't get, they ain't get they don't fuel. Get fuel but... I don't care. I want to see fuel. I don't care. I want to Give see me. Fat Boy holding a fuel can. <laughs> this is Vegas, mate. You in America. You raise yeah, America. You're in America. You better find a dump can, buddy. <laughs> One, the biggest topic probably is that Max Verstappen could seal the deal, a fourth world championship for him. Uh, which puts him in incredibly rare air. He basically just has to finish ahead of Norris to do that. But there's only 60 points left to claim after this weekend. Um, 
he would also basically seal it if they both failed to uh, score a point. So, right. It's it's basically over potentially. Could he do it at the Las Vegas GP? I think that'd be a big moment for F1 to have him crown the champ here. Uh, obviously, not great for the last few races of the season in terms of the intrigue there. But at least if you're going to do it at a place that isn't the last race of the season, do it in one of their biggest events, most expensive events in Las Vegas. That's kind of cool for them. Yep. Yep. So tune in to us. I don't know if you had any more F1 to talk about, but tune in to us Friday and Saturday on motorsport.com. This will be during FP3 qualifying and the race on Saturday night going into Sunday. And, you know, honestly, big thanks from us at the money lap, me and Parker, the whole team, big thanks from us to uh, F1 and to motorsport.com for allowing us to talk about their platform, to talk about racing um, and and doing it on their platform um it's it's a uh, it's a really cool opportunity we're excited to do it come stay up with us all night i also think it is a global stream so we are not geo-blocked which is wild so we will have people from around the world especially I've ones been who have no idea up on my are. italian uh yeah. my french uh, arabic. all of my did you yep, get arabic, arabic in there so yep we are gonna have to do a, a couple different shout outs i think in arabic um, yeah are you ready for your arabic ad read that's going to be great. I can't wait for that one. Mm-hmm. Uh, I feel pretty confident about it. Yep. Um, I'm pretty much ready for it all. So uh, one thing before we completely leave F1. So Max Verstappen did drive a uh, IMSA. Uh, what do you call it? A hypercar. <laughs> GTP car. Sorry. That hypercar is from WEC. I should know these things. I am obviously tired. I am so sorry. Listen. <laughs> Um, so they, he got to drive that, which was pretty cool. He did have a bunch of quotes about wanting to do the Rolex 24. He loves that race. He just said it's tough with their schedules and such, but he absolutely wants to do it. So he got to test that a little bit. I saw that. I think Yuki Sonoda got to drive the Indy car, uh, which was cool. There's so all the drivers are doing these fun things, uh, around this race, which is awesome. And it was cool to see Max jump in some different stuff. He was hanging out with Scott Dixon, and Colin Braun, which was cool. And, um, yeah, I think overall it's just good to to see him experiencing different motorsports. He definitely has an interest. He, the only thing he said is he doesn't want to do the Indy 500. He has a massive respect for it but doesn't want to do it, which I can – look, I can totally respect because it's an incredible event, but it would be such a massive difference in what he's done if, if he could go have more fun racing sports cars and endurance racing because he does that on – sim racing all the time and that's his favorite kind of other form of racing he i could see that you know that's a cool thing and why not so he he would be following my saying which is get every pro race car driver's goal should be to get rich and go sports car racing so (laughs) well go ahead i have a fun fact about this championship what Uh, is that if uh, Max Verstappen wins this championship, it will be the third time in history that Las Vegas has hosted the race in which clinched the F1 championship. Hmm. That's in 1981 and 1982, the Caesar Palace Grand Prix. Yeah, that was in a parking lot. If you show <laughs> you, to show you how far things have come, that was literally in the Caesar Palace parking lot. It was such a funny thing back then. That, like People made fun of it. Who won it with uh, 81, 82? Would that have been Alan Jones? Uh, Nelson PK and Kiki Rosberg. Well, screw me. Shows my knowledge. Jeez. I should so, have known that. There you go. Fun fact. Right. Las Vegas has, in fact, hosted F1 championships before. So there so you go. So it would be the third one. He wouldn't even be unique. Nope. Well, that's all right. I don't know what it puts him at four. Is he in the – that would be – who's our four-plus champions? Vettel. Obviously, you have Michael and all the seven and uh, Lewis, Fangio. Let me see. Who's, who else has four? Uh, Help me out here. I'm working on it. Hold on. You find I'm, it. I'm fine. Landon, what, what did you want? It? You had a response to my Verstappen IMSA. Well, I, I wanted to ask you, does it, does it seem to you like – this generation of drivers globally right now are uh, 
expanding into different disciplines in a way more similar to the drivers of the 70s and 80s, the 60s, 70s, and 80s? Are we, are we bringing that? Is that coming back? Or maybe was that always there and I just didn't notice it and now I'm paying closer attention? Like, what's the... Um, what what's your feeling there? It just see well, I don't my perception before I answer my own question. My perception yep. is that when I grew up watching racing, every driver was very much in their silo of profession, right? NASCAR drivers were just mm -hmm. running NASCAR. And I guess you did have Dale Earnhardt like running some Rolex stuff, but it seemed almost ceremonious to me um at the time. I don't mean to discount what they were accomplishing, but how dare you? Yeah. How dare you disrespect <laughs> um, the number three? I don't know. It just Damn. seemed like the drivers were very specialized in their disciplines. And then now drivers are venturing out a little bit more and crossing disciplines. And we have NASCAR drivers, you know, running a lot of different stuff and supercars drivers running NASCAR and IndyCar drivers going back and forth and F1 drivers. Like it's just the endurance stuff. Um, I don't know. What are your thoughts? So I think it has ebbed and flowed. I think in the the 90s, things got siloed. I think in the early 2000s, things were – well, I would say NASCAR drivers got siloed because they became the biggest thing and therefore weren't allowed to do anything else really besides you saw a couple Indy 500 doubles. But I don't know. I felt that was rare. Um, and I think in the mid-2010s, a lot of series were hurting, so that was probably stopping some of the transfer. But what's happened now, which I think has been the big globalization of motorsports and why you see drivers jumping around, is the teams expanding with, like, McLaren becoming an IndyCar team and an F1 team. You see Andretti attempting to do the same thing, and they're involved in supercars in Australia, and they're involved tangentially in potentially NASCAR. And it, it's like they're all these – organizations are expanding into different racing series, which then obviously gives a very easy point of entry for drivers to move around and jump around and try different things. I think the manufacturers have become less siloed. So, you know, if you look back in the 90s and the 2000s, it was tougher to find a manufacturer that would do an F1 program and a NASCAR program and an IndyCar program or so on and so forth. And now you have that. And so I think the that has helped because we know the manufacturers have a lot of control over drivers. So those same sorts of things allow the drivers to do it. But, you know, the F1 drivers, because they're the prettiest girls at the party right now, because F1's mm -hmm. the most popular thing there is on the planet in terms of motorsports at the moment, they are siloed and they're stuck. They're not allowed because they're, once you become that pretty, there's so much money that everyone stops you and doesn't allow you to go do other stuff. And so, you know, they, until that sort of fizzles down, they'll be stuck in doing that when you get to F1 and there'll be too many eyes on it and they won't allow them to do other things. And then you can get to where you know NASCAR has fallen from what it was, where it was in the mid two thousands to where it is now, and it allows because there's just not so many eyes on it, and there's not so much, you know, sponsorships controlling things. You can jump around a little bit more, like we see Larson doing, and you know, have a sponsor like Hendrick Cars, who also is the team owner, who allows him to go do something like he did in IndyCar, and so I think that helps as well. So it just opens it up, right? But it's always going to ebb and flow, and it's always going to come down to basically three factors. Does is you know will the manufacturer allow it, <laughs> or will they allow them to drive a different type of manufacturer, or do they have to be in the same one? Which then means they've got that manufacturer has to be in the other series they want to go drive. Will the sponsors allow it? Will the current main you know number one priority job allow you to go drive something else? And that's how mm -hmm. it goes down. Uh, to our question earlier about where Max would rank with four championships. That would put him tied for fourth with Prost and Vettel. Uh, obviously, Juan Malfangio has five, Lewis has seven, and Michael Schumacher has seven. So he's getting into rare air. Was probably always destined for that with his abilities. That guy is an incredible race car driver. Should we talk NASCAR? Let's. Let's do it. All right. So we start with you being the uh, legal representative of Money Lap. <laughs> everyone's favorite topic which has fizzled a little bit in terms of people talking and paying attention but the 2311 dropped the injunction appeal amid nascar removing the antitrust lawsuit clause in the open team agreement so i don't even know where this leaves everything but they have done this 
this moment has happened. This thing has occurred well, of which I don't even understand potentially. Uh, and I'm I'm going off of Bob Pockers' reportings here. So mm-hmm. uh, the, what he's what Bob is saying is by not by dropping this appeal, it could potentially allow them to refile the injunction. Mm. Um. So it doesn't completely mean that they've just put their weapons down in terms of trying to get uh, the, a court to allow them to uh, run with a charter next year. It doesn't mean they're giving up on that, I guess, is what I think. Um, I think I understand. So they're saying that circumstances in their, in their statement yesterday or in the, in the decision or whatever, they're saying that circumstances have changed in the underlying case, removing the need for this appeal and necessitating appellates to seek new relief from the district court. So I don't, that was not gibberish. specific on what those, well, I, I, I guess, yeah, I don't know. So what do they, are they refiling the appeal or what the, I don't know what that means, but that's what it sounds like. All right. Well, good luck to them on that legal mumble jumble. Um, <laughs> I really, I, when it gets that legally in legalese, I just, my eyes glaze over. I can't keep up. That's why lawyers make so much money because they can look at that stuff and make it into English somehow, I guess. What are the big question marks in the TV area for NASCAR has in the cup series has been answered by the way, TNT and Amazon will be using the same booth for all of their races, which is 10 combined races, um, which will be Steve Letarte, the one of the most incredible TV talents in NASCAR. Adam Alexander, one of the top play-by-play guys, so smooth. And Mr. Dale Earnhardt Jr. That's It'll it. Be good. Yeah. It's a good one. It's a good booth. It's a good booth. You basically will have Steve Letarte, which I would assume – uh for a long portion of the season but he is he's uh he's top notch man he's incredible i've talked about enough on this show but he's he's the top of the heap when it comes to tv talent for nascar in my opinion some driver news this one was widely talked about and expected for over what 4 months now that is that 23 racing 2311 racing names riley herbst as the driver of his new car a third car in the number 35, which they dis- they say the number came from the 3 from the 23 and the 5 from 45, which combined makes 35. That's a uh, it's an awesome number pick. <laughs> and and uh, I just I, I had to do that. I was like, that is a wild explanation as to how you got this number. <laughs> um. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, they just, uh, you know, we're definitely going long on five stickers in that shop and just adding <laughs> a three. <laughs> so, you know, it obviously shows a little, I, I think that it, to me, just shows what 2311's been working on, that they have on a been on a path to racing next year, hell or high water. Um, these deals don't happen overnight. And I am, I love Denny Hamlin big fan of him i think it just shows that there's some dis just i think there's this disingenuous communication from denny to the public in the last month um over his intentions to race next year and all this stuff because you know a week ago he was saying they don't have they have no idea if they can have cars ready for daytona or they're having cars ready they have no idea what they're doing right don't know Mm -hmm. if they're gonna race and then they'd sign riley herbst it's like okay, that happened overnight. Like what? I don't know. It just, I, I think that there's. I think it's interesting. Do you but, think he is posturing in some respect? Yeah, I think it was. I think most of what he was saying there about not racing next year, not knowing if he was going to race next year, yada yada yada. I think that's all posturing, um, and maybe he had to do it, right? Maybe it's that they're only you know. Their only chance with um, this this injunction um, was to some you know prove to the court that they had just irreparable or you know what's the word irreparable 
ir- irreparable damages to the team and organization if there was no charter. So, you know, in his mind, he had to sort of va- back that up and say, oh, my gosh, if we don't get a charter, we may not race, and we don't know. We'll shut down, and our driver could leave, and his, you know, Tyler Reddick is not beholden to us, and da-da-da-da. Um, and I guess you could be right about that. but um, Yeah. But, you know, the entire time behind the scenes, they were working on a deal with adding a third car and had a driver probably already signed, if not ready to sign. So he also it was also announced that Riley is bringing his crew chief from his Xfinity efforts here this past year, Davin Restivo, with him to 2311 as the crew chief. They did mention their TBD on their charter status for the third car. It's supposed to be one that is acquired from the Stuart Haas Racing Sell off. Um, yeah. So we'll see. What's been the most interesting? One note part on of- the driver side. What's that? Just, well, I mean, I I think um, you know Riley's a driver that's come a long ways, and I think he's done a really good job these last two years. Yeah, this year, um, I mean, massive. I actually watched respect. with the <clears throat> only because of this announcement. I think my my algorithm gave me um, a clip of his win in Indy, and I watched the last three laps of his win in Indy, and but. I mean, he had a rocket ship of a car, but he was racing his teammate for the win. So, you know, I'm, I'm going to give him some fair game on that and Eric Amarola. And, and I could just tell by the way he's driving his car, the way he backed up the, you know, the minimum speed in his corner to make sure he had a good runoff and he was showing his left front fender the way he was sort of had the shallow entry and was keeping air on his left front fender. I was like, those are some very good tactical moves. If you go back and watch the Xfinity race from Indy that he won, um, he was making some very, very good tactical moves that led to his win, um, I thought. So it was, uh, you know, he's come a long ways. He's, he's, done, he's done a good job. I shouldn't say that sounds That sounds demeaning, but, you know, I think <laughs> he's done a really good job. Jeez. He, the win at Vegas last year dominated. Was an won by 15 seconds. That's a mile and a half and a really low grip mile and a half that you have to put your left front on the white line and everything, and he did that incredibly well the the indie win was special for the reasons you mentioned i just watched it on uh x the other day as well and then phoenix i mean that's a flat short track esque track and i think one of the toughest tracks and he won there this year so to finish out the season so i I think that's a pretty diverse set of tracks to win on and actually (laughs) two different packages because remember we ran that low down that low horsepower package at Indy. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that was actually to your point, it just kind of showed his progression of it's not just like he won on a super speedway or he won on mile and a half only. It's like, that is three very distinct different racetracks in, in different skill sets and was able to win on all three of them. So that's, it's very impressive. Um, you know, the, one of the funny things I don't like to jump into rumors, that sort of stuff, but one of the, the, the things that's been talked about with this move is for months it's been said basically that Riley's, you know, family has bought this charter apparently. And that was kind of an interesting part to this. I have no confirmation on that. So I don't want to go much further in it, but I just think that was discussed. Obviously that wasn't mentioned in any of this charter discussion and where charter things are at. Um, But I just thought like that is, is a interesting antidote to this whole thing. Anecdote Mm -hmm. um, that, we haven't heard of that being done it before, but if it turns out to be true, possibly one of the smarter things I've seen done in motorsports, and especially in the NASCAR realm, if you're a mm-hmm. family who and it's, wants to invest in your, you know, their career and that sort of thing, to get an asset along with it is one mm-hmm. of the most genius things I've seen done. If that turns out to be true, uh, I just I love that. I think it's so smart. <laughs> So, and that's, that will actually be, thank you for bringing something tangible to this conversation because instead of me pretending like I know anything about the legal issues that are going on and then probably unfairly, you know, criticizing Denny for his messaging in the last month, um, that is an interesting storyline to follow because if the Herbst family is buying the charter they are essentially using 2311 as the operator of the charter, right? It's like an yep. op, it's it's an operating agreement or a, or you know, they 2311 is a service provider to the Herbs family for this charter. And that is not an arrangement that hasn't happened yet. What a, what a weird way to say that. That has happened under the charter agreement. Right? 
and yep. it's it's happened quietly in in many different ways. Um, one off the top of my head that and they've and they and in these scenarios where it's happened, they've had to do some interesting agreements to satisfy NASCAR. But one, for example, was when Joe Falk owned um, the Charter. I think it was the thirty three car. Uh, back in the early charter days, he kind of hopped from team to team as like the partner of the team, but he was really just the charter owner. And so like when he went to LFR, Levine Family Racing, and brought his charter there, um, if I'm remembering everything right, and you can help me because I don't know how much you knew about all this, but he he brought the charter and then they ran it. Right, and they had this agreement that showed that they owned half the charter. But if you remember, when the dust settled, who ended up with the charter? Joe Paul. <laughs> right. So, like, however, all these agreements were structured to satisfy NASCAR's charter agreement because they wanted to prove that people weren't just renting the charters out. Um, they had to show that they owned the charter, or that there was a fifty-fifty ownership in the charter, and. But at the end of the day, Joe Falk owned the charter. He was hopping from team to team, sort of partnering with the team side as an operator. He was sort of the equity owner of the charter, and then they, the two would pair together, and then they would run a race car, right? Yep. And then he hopped from, uh, you know, he hopped from uh, Archie St. Hilaire to Levine Family Racing to BJ McLeod, and it sort of like, you know, that that was sort of how that worked. This this could be very similar right where the herbst family just owns this charter <clears throat> and they're going to teams right it's almost imagine them um submitting an rfp a request for proposal to all these race teams to say all right we own a charter who is willing to operate this charter for us right and at what cost and oh by the way the driver has to be our son riley and that's sort of that is a potential for how that a, arrangement looks like. And then so you would would say, the twenty three eleven raised their hand and said, "Hey, we'll operate that charter for you, um, if you fund the operations of the race team to the tune of ten, fifteen, twenty million dollars, whatever it costs, right? You if you fund those operations, we will have whatever driver you want drive the car. So Riley Herbst is a driver that will drive the car and we can approve it through Toyota. They'll approve it as a driver, him as a driver. Um, and you know, we can either pay the driver a salary or you can pay the driver the salary, whatever it's built into the deal. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and then there will be some kind of arrangement over who owns the sponsorship on the car. Right. So who has the rights to sell the sponsorship? Does Herbst still retain the rights to sell the sponsorship? And 2311 is just purely, this you know service provider for the operations of the car or does herps sort of hand over the sponsorship rights of the car and tell 2311 you can sell the sponsorship right that's that would be that's you know part of the deal so um yeah seeing that herps i think has did they announce it with monster energy on the car yeah it's monster energy um, yeah so yep. you could assume that herps retained some kind of sponsorship rights or or control the, the direction of the sponsorship um, with 2311 but that's it that's an interesting theory to how that could work if herbst was actually the owner of the charter yeah and we don't know we don't know right now but it it is an interesting thought of just when you've seen you know for years you've seen families maybe sponsor the car or that they just provide backing behind the scenes but to do this model would be really interesting i know it, you you mentioned it there's been a couple cases of this if you think of spire you know when they first acquired the 78 charter from uh, furniture row they ran it with jay robinson remember mm -hmm. that and he basically operated it for them and right. they you know service it and then they became a standalone race team themselves That's so, an that is an, a perfect example of it they yeah. were they hired jay robinson for essentially a call it a flat fee to just say hey here's your budget go run a race car we own the charter um, and then, you know, at the end of the year, their contract was up. I think it was a two year deal they did with Jay. Um, they did two years, their contract was up. Inspire said, Hey, we, you know, we've watched you operate. We've learned about how to operate a race team. Um, we've positioned ourselves to become a standalone race team. So now we're going to, we're going to take our operations in house to where we own the charter and operate it. Um, that's a it, perfect example. It does bring up, you know, I know this has been a discussion before of this sort of shadow ownership of these charters, right? And I do believe that there's been some efforts by NASCAR to sort of 
make it public who owns these, right? Because I think, and I don't know this for sure, and Josh can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think in other most pro sports, they kind of have to show the ownership cap table and such. Um, and it's not really that required to be public knowledge with these charters. You know, is that a good thing or a bad thing for NASCAR, right? Should it, should it just have to be public, essentially? I, hey, this is the ownership structure of these things. This is the cap tables. This I is all, to me, it's content, right? Like, if you're going to leave it open, well, it's content. I think it's more than just content. I think it's I think it's a bad thing that it's not public. I think there should be transparency. There doesn't have to be transparency, but I think there should be transparency in it. And I think NASCAR should want transparency. Um, if I could, you know, push NASCAR a little bit from my perspective, I would say, hey, no, make it public, right? There should be transparency on who owns these charters, who owns the race teams. Um, you want that because that is, it's not just content, it's authenticity, right? It's part of yeah. story, the story the authentic nature of the sport, right? And if your fans don't trust what they see in front of them, if they think there's more to it and there's things that's being kept from them and cup games being moved and stories that they're not privy to, then they're going to be less interested in the sport. And I think we've seen that, right? Yeah. People are turned off by the fact of a driver who is obviously a pay driver, obviously bringing money, but is somehow pretending to that like he found sponsorship, right? Or or that they need sponsorship, or they you know it's, it's like pretending that the sponsors on their car aren't actually affiliated with them. Like it's it's very disingenuous, right? It's inauthentic, yep. and it I just can't kills the that. story. I can't stand that. Yeah, and so I love, I love it being more open. You know, yeah, just like and so it just make it open. It, who cares? It, yeah, and so it. I, I think that making that stuff more transparent and open allows the media to figure out the stories and to tell the stories. And then the public is interested because they know the real story and it holds the whole, you know, the whole, um, sport accountable to authenticity. Yep. Um, and so there's probably plenty of reasons that things need to be private or can be private. And just because, you know, uh, you don't have to make everything public, but I think that in this world, um, in the world, in the world we live in, authenticity is the the currency of highest value. <laughs> yeah, and and so the sport should probably make decisions that lean towards authenticity every chance they get. We want to know who owns them. We want to know who's there. And unfortunately, you won't <laughs> see either of our names beside any of those cap tables. Not yet. Wait, hold up, money lap coming for one here soon. <laughs> Back off. We're gonna we're we're gonna make it happen, man. Um, one more team related, uh, sort of news regarding charters and such would be that JTG has been rebranded as Hayek Motorsports with owner Gordon Smith, uh, having assumed operational control from Tad and Jody Gesector. Hayek Maritime is Gordon Smith's maritime company in Washington. So he is now that team has changed its name essentially awesome. and ownership yeah so they'll c- continue on i know stenhouse was announced to continue driving i've seen gordon and uh brad doherty and um who's the the guy who runs it all what's his name again ernie cope ernie cope i've seen them out to dinner about three or four times in the last three or four races that we were at in the season. Yeah. I, bump, I don't know what it was, but we were all in the day, same dinner, dinner schedule and same restaurants. Um, yeah. I so, love it. Gordon's a dear friend of mine. Um, yeah. I'm proud of, proud of him and that team and what they've accomplished. They've done a lot together. Um, so that's awesome. You know, yeah. I, I think that, you know, losing Kroger is obviously a challenge to the team and, you know, they'll have to replace them. But um, the, the little bit that I've talked to Gordon about it, he has told me that he is still full steam ahead. So it's cool. I like to see, you know, continued investment and more names being represented in, uh, in the series. It's just a good thing. And, and newer names, you know, that's uh, not many people have seen the Hayek sort of branding, but that makes it feel new and different. And so we'll see how they do. You mentioned Kroger. They finally announced that they are moving to RFK Racing starting in 2025, uh, and Ryan Priest will join RFK to drive the number 60 Ford Mustang full-time in the NASCAR Cup Series. Big nice. deal. That's yeah. a big sponsorship deal for RFK spread over those three cars. 
big deal for Ryan Priest, you know, to go there. I would say of his cup career, probably the best opportunity, right? You know, speaking it's of weird JTG, to say that, isn't it? It is weird, right? Because he was at Stuart Haas Racing, but they were in such a downturn, you know, the time he was there and going through so much flux. I'd say this is his big, big opportunity in the Cup Series. Well, it, honestly, the fact that he got to JTG in the first place hmm. was a huge opportunity. Yep. And then, you know, him keeping himself there is a huge accomplishment, and he is owed a ton of credit for that. Um, but the fact that he made it, you know, that he got that JTG ride when he got it um, was, I think you know, a huge accomplishment, but this is, this is just a great progression for him in his career and a great, you know, part of his story. Like this is just kind of an old school racer story. He's continuing that. I had a friend ask me about this, uh, yesterday and I was like, look, to your point, priest is the racers racers. I think he would like to say like that guy only cares about racing. He is a short, he is a really good short track racer really good you know think of the pole he got at martinsville this year and just the way he runs at those tracks i think that's probably what rfk sees in him and then for brad keselowski i think he sees he respects racers like that who have worked hard and had to do you know grind through the ladder system and and win to get opportunities and that sort of thing and and leapfrog from opportunity to opportunity and so i definitely see that where brad would have the level of respect for priest uh, and want to bring him into the fold at RFK. So those cars look cool too. And the the uh, the announcements they put out, they had the the three Kroger cars spread out. It was it was pretty cool. So and good to see Kroger staying in the NASCAR Cup Series as a major sponsor. Biggest, I think they're the biggest grocery store chain in America. So that's a big one. Hmm. Xfinity Series had some driver news. Chris Wright will join R Motorsports, which Anthony Alfredo was in that car this past season. I did speak to Anthony for a bit about a month ago about his situation. He was unsure what was going to happen at that time. He actually is, we've talked about this often with some of these drivers in the Xfinity series who have that one and a half million, two million, two and a half million range of sponsorship. They get kind of, they can't get to the next level of, of ride, but you know, they kind of want to improve or they're in a tough spot of being able to even pay themselves anything versus getting the ride they want to be in so on and so forth. And so, I know Anthony has some great dedicated partners, but he's been having to work through the, the best place and the best opportunity for them and himself. Uh, but looks like our motorsports might not be the place unless they were to run a second car. Uh, as Chris Wright said, he's joining there. And Parker Retzloff will not be back at Jordan Anderson Racing next year. So we'll see who maybe fills that seat if they continue to run two cars hmm. where he goes. Yeah. Is this a result of Daytona? Oh, we're the cup race? I don't yeah. I don't know about that as much as I, I think if you look at their season, I talked to Parker about their season a couple months ago, and I mean they've had an immense amount of DNFs. And he's he's obviously really fast, especially short tracks. Talk about qualifier short tracks. If you had to get I mean, honestly, one driver in the top three series, if I was like, I need the fastest short track qualifying lap, I think I'd call that guy. <laughs> he's unbelievable. I don't know how he does it. Um his qualifying average at short tracks in the Xfinity Series has to be insane, you know. So I think there's just – that hasn't – the their reliability hasn't been there in those race cars. They haven't been able to get the finishes that they probably would want or commiserate to the speed they've been able to show at times. And so I think for him it's probably, once again, trying to find a better situation for the ability to improve and to, you know, get better results as with any of these moves. So – and in the truck series, Landon, old buddy here, Mr. Hemrick, going to the 19 truck, Bill McAnally Racing, um, McAnally Higgleman, sorry. Um, I think it's a big deal for him. This is a yeah. chance to go win races and to make himself a winner. Very cool, and a good opportunity. I'm happy for him for that. Good yeah. place to make a living. It is, it is. And I think... Uh, you know, there, there will be some people, obviously, if he doesn't win immediately, they'll be on him. But I think if you look at what that choice is about, one, they have a really big sponsor in Napa that wants a name that's well-known, right? 
they want someone who's going to get in there and at least be a known quantity to get them to the championship forward. And I think you've got that with Daniel Hemrick. So Mm -hmm. for him, I don't know if he ever gets back to the Cup Series. This could be it. But if he goes and wins six races, a la John Hunter Nemechek, Mm -hmm. maybe it it does open up a path. So you never know, but he's still in the game. And he's in the top of that series in a truck that, you know, made the championship four. So I think that could work out for him. And I've talked to him a bit about it and he's, he seemed pretty excited. So awesome. I think he just wants to win, you know, when he's, his two cup stints, I saw this the, uh, the other day, basically his two cup stints at RCR and at colleague were when those two teams were at like their worst <laughs> poor guy, <laughs> like the year he was at RCR, they were terrible. And I was like, that is, that is just bad timing. So, and I think for colleague, I mean, they, they were, they were open that the cup program was not the priority when they took AJ Omdinger out of it. Right. Right. And that I just think shows, um, unfortunately for him that those two cup efforts were going to be uphill battles both times. So anything else in your mind? Not on the NASCAR side. I think that's, uh, that, that about covers it. So we're going to be talking about Las Vegas the next couple of nights till late <laughs> i but gotta this, get rested up hey we got we got to go to sleep which means unfortunately for the las vegas native that's been sitting here i mean he probably left 15 minutes ago josh did he he left 15 minutes ago didn't he? <laughs> uh, he yeah i don't know where he went he said he's gonna Jesus. go grab a drink and i, I think he's you know, still <laughs> he just doesn't like the banter at this point i, I he just never gives us the time we're gonna what if get we there. actually got him to join the live stream that could be a potential possibility <laughs> Don't, never say never. Never say never. Unfortunately, Kyle Busch, he did leave. He's not going to make it on today. But we'll try again next week, as always. Thank you all for listening. Peace. Thanks for listening or watching. If you want to be heard on this show, go to moneylap.com to leave us a voicemail. Be funny, be irreverent, or be insightful, but don't be dumb. If you're watching on YouTube, please like, comment, and subscribe. That helps us grow. And if you're listening, please leave us a five-star review to be featured on this show. Follow us on X, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. We'll see you there.